Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Okay, it, it looks like we're at 11 o'clock, uh, so we're going to get started. Again, uh, good morning. My name is Linda Goulden. I am a Master Gardener and a Master Naturalist, and today we're going to be talking about um, some of the things that may come up on your internet screen um, and whether or not you really need to, to worry about them. Please, if, if we have some technical glitches this morning, uh, it's Christina and I running the show, so we, we're doing our best. So we're going to explore a few of those sensational headlines that you see on your Facebook feed um, from the entomological world. And again, we're going to stretch that because there's a couple of worms that I'm going to talk about. Uh, we'll talk about the threat level of these critters, give you some guidelines on the appropriate response to the organisms, and um, hopefully a common sense look at some, some really cool creatures. Now, because these are five disjointed, um, not necessarily connected um, creatures, we'll stop after each creature if you have questions about them. And again, we ask that you put your questions in the chat box and Christina will keep me posted on what's, uh, what's happening in the chat box. So let me get started. Um, this happens to be a uh, screenshot from my computer um, about Joro spiders, and you can take a look at the dates on most of these uh, entries, and they are all fairly current. Uh, March 2022 was when the Joro spider started coming up in the news, and of course, when it comes up in the news, here at the help desk in Prince William County, we inevitably get the panicked uh, client who has a Joro spider and wants to know what they should do about it. So. The first uh, critter that I'm going to talk about is this uh, Joro spider. Um, it's a, a golden orb weaver spider. It's a native of Japan. It was introduced in the United States in 2013, and it was probably brought here um, as a stowaway on shipping containers. Joro spiders can spread by ballooning, which means they uh, trail a long silken thread and let the wind carry them about. They have a fairly high metabolism compared to other spiders, um, like the silk, silk spider. And what that means is that the Joro spider is able to survive colder conditions. The impact of that is that it could potentially spread to climates which are not as mild as um, Georgia, where it's currently being monitored at. Uh, the really good thing to know about our friend the Juro spider is that its fangs are generally not large enough to puncture human skin. So like all spiders, it has venom, but it's not going to be biting humans. The ecological impact of the Juro, it, um, and this is from Andy Davis at the Odom School of Ecology in Georgia, is that it has little to no impact on food webs or ecosystems, and, and it's been being observed there, observed there since 2016. It's possible that this beautiful um, orb weaver could become a food source for some native predators. It probably could survive most of the eastern seaboard climate. Now that's not saying that it's going to move into the mountains. The climate there is probably too harsh for it. And the biggest factor in the spread of this spider is human spread. It, it gets itself attached to um, shipping pallets or uh, train cars and travels along transportation highways. So the bottom line, and this is from the people that want to sell you control at any cost, uh, Terminex says that due to the lack of impact by this spider, it's not necessary to do any kind of pesticide application. So the moral of the story here is that we don't want to panic about the Joro spider. Okay, so I can see from the chat box that there weren't any uh, any questions, so I'm assuming y'all are good on the, the Joro spider. We're going to move on to the next critter. I have a question. The murder hornets. Hang on, Linda. Grant has a question. 
Okay, go ahead. So, does it? Uh, how does it survive over the winter? And if, are you saying that it would also survive up in the northern, eastern seaboard states? It does. It it probably would not survive beyond the mid Atlantic um, because it's metabolism is not that high. I don't know the biology of it well enough to um, to tell you, you know, how far north uh, a latitude it would reach. But it, um, like most spiders, and, and again, I'm not an expert on spiders, kind of goes into a dormant phase. Um, I am assuming that its eggs would probably overwinter, um, but I, I don't really have the details on it. But the adult would die off before winter? Uh, yes, the adult would most likely die. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Are we ready to move on to murder hornets, Christina? I'm going to take that as a yes. Yes, sorry. I was on <laughs> mute. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so our friends, the murder hornets. Um, these guys, uh, this is Ves Vespa mandarinia. It is a true wasp, and its nickname is coming from the fact that it preys on honeybees. It murders honeybees, not humans, not livestock. Um, so it is a little scary. The queens can get to be two inches long. It has nearly a three-inch wingspan. It is a colony-forming wasp. Um, so it does all those wonderful waspy things. Now, this guy is not a, pre um, a pollinator. This is a predator. Um, so we're, we're not going to be saving the bees to save the murder hornets. Um, they are native to Asia. They were, um, the, the big sensation on murder hornets came during uh, September of 2019. And it's not like we didn't have enough going on in 2019. Uh, there was a nest found in Vancouver, Washington. Um, prior to that, it actually had been detected by a postal inspector in California who found someone who smuggled honeycomb from, uh, I, I, probably using the term honeycomb, it, it doesn't create honey like a bee, but it does create that characteristic cell uh, colony. So a nest was found in the mail in 2016. And you may ask yourself, self, why on earth would someone try to mail um, a murder hornet nest to the United States? Apparently, it is used in uh, traditional uh, medicines. You soak the nest in uh, some very delicious alcohol like a bourbon, and it becomes medicinal. Um, I will point out to you on this little guy, I hope you can see my uh, cursor. Whoops, sorry, got carried away there. Um, there's a transmitter that is attached to this uh, little guy, he's about two inches long, uh, with dental floss. And that's how the second nest in Washington was found, by tracking uh, workers that were uh, captured out on plants uh, in, in Washington. And um, they tracked a, to a second nest. Now, these particular wasps, thrive in mild and rainy climates. So that really isn't what Virginia has or what Prince William has. Um, we have a, a temperate climate, which is not quite as warm as uh, the coastal Oregon and Washington area. So we're not really a good location for these wasps. They prey primarily on other members of the Vespa family, the honeybees, the yellow jackets. So they also prey on flies and beetles. And this information is from analysis of frass um, from the nest that was recovered in Bellingham, Washington. Their sting can be very painful and they can sting multiple times. They know that some queens escaped from the initial find in 2019. Uh, in 2021, there were three nests found in the um, upper peninsula or in the no upper northwest area, and they were genetically re related to the first nests which were found. Um, there are no sightings reported outside of the Pacific Northwest, including British Columbia. 
So what we can do about the murder hornet is monitor. Of course, if someone you know thinks they have a murder hornet, we want to see at least a very good picture. Most of the time, what folks mistake as a murder hornet in our area is a very large wasp called a cicada killer. Um, the West Coast is maintaining very high vigilance, um, and it is not a threat to the East Coast. What you see in the picture here is a researcher in a st supposedly stingproof um, suit carbon dioxiding the nest that was found in Bellingham, Washington. So they, they really tried to contain it by uh, wrapping the tree in saran wrap, and you know they were really trying to protect themselves from the sting. So the, uh, the West Coast is really all over the murder hornet, but it's not something that's imminently threatening to Virginia. So what questions, do we have any questions, Christina, on the murder hornets? There are none in the chat box. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, on the slide before this one, what was that jug for? That's a trap. Uh, it's filled with orange juice. The Washington State Department of Agriculture, um, they're constantly trapping to catch um, the workers that, that are out, um, if, there, if there are any, so that they can put those tracking devices on them and monitor them to find where the nests are. And they haven't found more. Okay, they, uh, the last uh, information I had were, was about the uh, 2021 three nests that were genetically related to the first that was found. But it's not like this is um, widespread in the Pacific Northwest and they are monitoring it very closely. So that trap doesn't kill them? Uh, no, that's orange juice in there. Um, and they're trying to capture a live uh, hornet. Does it end up catching other bees and hornets? Well, I'm sure it does. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so from uh, let's see, this is from Ben Williams, who's the Administrator of Science at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. He says, as of now, murder hornets are just about the last thing we should worry about here in Virginia. While it's certainly possible that these hornets could spread, it would take them a long, long time to get there. Fortunately, major steps are being taken to control and hopefully eradicate the Asian giant hornets in Washington and British Columbia. So I think this is one we can put our minds to rest about. Um, they're not going to be here anytime soon. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next terror of the times, the invasive fire ants. Now, uh, notice once again, this uh, particular article is from the Virginia Mercury. May 31st of this year. So this is current. Um, people are concerned about fire ants moving across Virginia. So the currently known distribution of imp red imported fire ants in Virginia is shown on this map. Red is where there is a current quarantine. Orange is there's a widespread infestation, but it's not yet quarantined. And yellow is Basically, there are small localized populations. So you can see it's, these are really concentrated in southern Virginia. There's nothing anywhere close to Prince William County yet. So red imported fire ants, uh, RIFA for short, they're not necessarily red. They come in red and they come in black and they come in red and black. They are a polymorphic species, which means that they come in many sizes. Um, some of them even have wings. They are colony living ants. Uh, the picture that we have there is uh, some fire ant workers that are feeding on a hot dog. And all of the photos that you see in here are from a Virginia Tech 2019 publication. So to positively identify a fire ant, now I'm not sure who's gonna wanna get this close, but you have to find 10 segments on the antenna. You can see that in the picture right here. And this bifurcated waist, it has a two-segmented waist or petiole. So um, it's not, you know, it's not their, their, their little fangs here. It's uh, the antenna and the waist, which are the definitive characteristics for um, a 
uh, red imported fire ant. There are actually four species of fire ants currently in the United States. The tropical fire ant Solenopsis geminates is native to the United States, primarily in the Gulf states and in Florida. Uh, I think, well, Texas is a Gulf state, okay. Um, but these are not in Virginia. The southern fire ant Solenopsis zylani is also a native, also in the Gulf states, um, and also not in Virginia. The black imported fire ant, now this is an invasive, Solenopsis richteri is also um, not in Virginia. Um, and then there's our, the one that, that we're really focused on here, the RIFA, the red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta, which is invasive and then found in Southern Virginia. Um, this particular fire ant is also, both the imported ants came, um, are believed to have come into the United States through the port of Mobile, Alabama. Um, and they are established in the southern states as well as um, the red fire ant in Virginia. But the red fire ant, where it's present, tends to um, obliterate the other species. It actually, um, red fire ants will uh, do away with native populations of geminate or xylani, and they will do away with the richteri, uh, but they will also interbreed with them. So, they're really quite the king, uh, the king of the hill as far as ants go. So how will you know if you have RIFA? Um, these are again pictures from Virginia Tech. The most, uh, the first thing that, that people are going to notice, and these would be uh, farmers or homeowners, is the cone-shaped fire ant mound. Um, you see the picture there on the left. They're, they're pretty, um, pretty large. And here's a picture of a fire ant mound in a soybean field in, down in Suffolk. So if the red imported fire ant were to show up in Nova, you would find them first in open areas that are exposed to the sun. That's the habitat that this um, ant prefers. It likes cultivated fields and pastures. Uh, in more urban settings, you would find it in cemeteries, parks, playgrounds, and yards. They do not establish in wooded areas. They will establish in structures uh, like inside walls and under sidewalks. So this insect was first detected in Hampton Roads in 1989. The federal fire ant quarantine was instituted by the USDA and the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services in 2009. What that fire ant quarantine states is that it is illegal to ship plant material, sod, mulch from infested areas to non-quarantine areas unless it's approved by a USDA inspector. Um, and that means a lot to growers, um, people who work in agriculture. What it means to the homeowner is that the Virginia Department of um, consumers, uh, agriculture and consumer science no longer treats fire ant mounds that are in quarantine areas. So it becomes the responsibility of the homeowner to actually manage uh, fire ant mounds on their own property. If there are uh, RIFA infestations outside of the quarantine areas, those need to be reported to the VDAC's Office of Plant and Pest Services. I have the address on a, a slide a little further on, so don't get excited if you uh, think you need to report um, a RIFA infestation. I will give you that information. Now, the other insects that we've talked about so far haven't really had an impact on the environment. RIFA does. It will interfere with pollinators and predatory insects. Um, like many ant species, it farms insects like scale, mealybugs, and aphids. Um, those scale, mealybugs, and aphids actually can cause a lot of plant damage in an agricultural setting. RIFA can also attack native ant populations and other arthropods impacting um, the health of the soil. 
There is data that supports a reduction in ground nesting vertebrates. Um, the rifa will eat eggs, they will eat uh, nestling small birds, small reptiles, amphibians, rodents. So um, these, can't, these actually do impact the environment and that's why um, if they are sited outside the quarantine area, we really do need to act on that. So again, you're looking for the mounds um, uh, and those should be reported to um, the Virginia Department of Consumer, I'm sorry, Agriculture and Consumer Sciences. Um, some specific impact to agriculture, the ants will feed on germinating seeds, so they're not the friend of corn, sorghum, or soybean growers. They can damage flower development in both citrus groves and uh, fruits like tomatoes. They will girdle nursery stock. Um, trees in particular, the picture that, that I've, I've got here from the Virginia Tech, um, I lied, that's, this is from a Texas A&M publication, um, shows a cornfield that's been infested by RIFA. And they can impact livestock because they are really nuisance pests. So RIFA has a pretty big impact on agriculture. So in Northern Virginia, what do we do? Now, I, I want to remind you that they were first discovered in Hampton, Virginia in 1989. That's a lot of years ago. So they haven't really moved very far beyond uh, the Hampton Roads area. So we are taking a watchful waiting approach. There's the address that and the contact information if you think you have potential sightings. The Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Service Office of Plant and Pest Service. They have both a website and a telephone number. Um, most importantly, do not import materials from quarantined areas. If you happen to be down in the Hampton Roads uh, area and you find a, uh, I don't know, maybe a crepe myrtle or something down there that you think is just fabulous, please don't bring it to our area um, because there is always the potential that it has been infected with um, red imported fire ants. So please do not import materials from quarantined areas. Okay, that was uh, my spiel on red imported fire ants. Christina, do we have any questions? Um, no, um, Grant asked for the address, which we have here. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Well, Are there other reasons uh, why we would contact VDAX? I mean, other types of uh, uh, visual visual agents of other invasive plants or okay I'm, I'm not really addressing all of the things one would contact um, the Department of Agriculture plant and pest services um, there are some other quarantines and I will be talking about one shortly um, but RIFA is one of the, one of the um, insects of concern right now because it is in the state of Virginia and um, like the other um, organisms that we've talked about so far, the biggest spread that we have is because of human movement. Um, most of the things um, that we're going we're to talk about today are, have all been spread by shipping containers or uh, along transportation corridors. So um, these are ones that we're aware of, um, the murder hornet and um, the red imported fire ant. The Juro spider, you know, it, it's it's not going to have a huge impact. Um, so, yeah, there are other things that you would report to the Office of Plant and Pest Services, but that's somewhat outside the scope of what we're going to do today. Okay, here's one that just this this one's creepy. Um, I, I don't know if any of you have ever encountered a hammerhead worm. This is a legitimate planaria. Um, this happens to be a tweet that uh, came up on my feed. It's uh, Bipalum is the uh, genus. Uh, these, these guys are creepy because they, they look very unusual. Uh, they're slimy. They reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, Bipalium coenza is the introduced species that's in, considered invasive in the United States and in parts of Europe. So um, this was uh, tweeted by Dr. Karen uh, Bonder, who is, uh, I believe, an entomologist. So 
she, she authors the uh, Underdone Comics. So, hammerhead worms are indeed in the United States. Um, I checked iNaturalist. There were 41 sightings of hammerhead worms in Fairfax County and 40 in Prince William County. Um, from Eric Day, who is the director of the insect lab at Virginia, De Virginia Tech, he says, I've been in Virginia for over 34 years, and I've seen them as long as he's been here. Now, understand, um, there are native hammerhead worms. Bi Bipali influenza is the one that is um, that we're most focused on as being an invasive. Um, most of the terrestrial flatworms, which um, the, these are um, a member of, um, they are in the phylum Platyhelminthes, which is just fun to say. Um, but most of them are aquatic worms. Uh, they have been, there's scientific documentation that establishes populations in North Carolina from the 1950s. They're shiny, slimy, variable in length. They go from uh, nearly an inch to like 20 centimeters in length. So to me, that's a little intimidating. If I find something that's snake length um, out, outside, I, I kind of want to keep my distance. Um, the species can be very different in form. They can look leaf-like to some that resemble snakes. So there are a lot of terrestrial flatworms. We're going to focus just on the hammerheads. They have different head shapes, numbers of eyes, striping patterns, um, and identification, positive identification of the individual species requires actual dissection to see the internal organs or um, DNA analysis. If you find a hammerhead worm, um, your best chance of identification is to send it to the help desk. Please don't send us the worm. Send us a picture of the worm, the top and the bottom, and a close-up of the head if you can get it. Now, um, if you insist on bringing in a sample, we would suggest that you preserve it in alcohol um, in a container. So um, these are six different species of hammerhead worms, which are present in Virginia. And that's just a sketch to kind of give you an idea of the different head shapes and uh, striping patterns. So the impact of the hammerhead worm is not well understood, OK? They, there just aren't a lot of uh, scientific studies out there on uh, terrestrial um, worms. The, we do know that they exhibit predatory behavior. They eat local earthworms, um, and because they eat earthworms, they would threaten vermiculture and vermicomposting. Um, they do have some human and animal health impacts. Bipalum coenza and Bipalium aventitum produce a tetrodotoxin, which is the same toxin as pufferfish, and they excrete that toxin uh, in the um, slime that they're covered in. So you don't want to touch these with your bare hands. Um, if you find one of them and you feel compelled to remove it or move it, we would recommend wearing gloves or using uh, tweezers. Some species, including Coenza and Aventitum, can carry um, infective stages of ra uh, rat lungworm. Um, there aren't any documented cases of transmission this way, but it's uh, believed to be possible that it could occur. So again, I don't, I could not find scientific documentation on this. Um, so it's probably a pretty rare occurrence, but it is a possibility as they carry the infection. So what do we do about hammerhead worms? First off, since they reproduce asexually, you do not want to cut up or smash the worms because you can make many more worms. If you find a hammerhead worm if, and you feel compelled to move it, you can pick it up with tweezers or with gloved hands. Seal it in a container. Now, um, I'm thinking, you know, the plastic bag with the zippers on it, um, and treat it. Probably the most humane way to kill it would be to freeze it. If you're offended by the notion of having um, toxic worms in your freezer with your food, I, I totally understand that. Um, and would recommend that alcohol will also kill it. If you bring in plants from outside sources, like this lovely, looks like it's a peace lily perhaps, um, 
you really need to inspect the roots. Things that are coming from tropical areas are more likely to have these worms in it. Um, so you definitely want to check the roots for this worm and for some others. So um, the bottom line, um, and this again is from our friend Eric Day at the uh, Virginia Tech Insect Lab, the numbers don't seem to get too outrageous. They might be a problem for earthworms or other soil-dwelling arthropods, but because of their low numbers, I don't think of them as having a very high impact. And again, remember they've been documented in North Carolina since the 1950s um, and just really haven't seen a lot of environmental devastation due to the hammerhead worms. So with that, let me ask, do you have any questions about the hammerhead worms? Hmm, I don't see any in the chat box. Does anybody, if you have a question, you can unmute and ask your question. I don't see anything. Okay, uh, let's move on to the jumping worms. Um, this is going to take me just a second to get everything working here, and I would advise you the audio may be a little low, so you might have to turn up your speakers. Let's see if we can make this work. I don't see the video, Linda. Better? Got it. The audio keeps cutting out. At least on mine it does. Here. Since the audio keeps cutting out, we can send this link for this video to everybody. I had them in water for quite a long time, as I was looking at them under the microscope. If you have them in your leaf litter, now these worms die in the winter months. They're in part of Maryland, they die. So sort of a near the reproductive region. And this band is really Guys are not jumping a lot because I soaked in the water far too long. Let's look at
Okay, um, again, I apologize if the quality of that wasn't fabulous. Um, we're going to come come back to going to take me just a second here because I'm not all that good. Here we go. Hang on. Bear with me. I'm trying to get us to the right spot. Almost there. So, Linda, you do have a question. Okay, hang on just a second. Let me get us to the right place, and we'll we'll take care of the question. All right, are we on the jumping worms? Uh, yep. Okay, all right, the question, I'm sorry. Is it genetic that the worms can move uh, more and jump than normal worms, or is it a learned thing? I, I'm sure that it's genetic. It's I, I genetic. mean, I don't have the details on it, but I'm... Um, they they do that. That's just their uh, their metabolism and their physiology is that they um, they are much more active than the earthworms. Now understand that earthworms are not native to um, Virginia. They they are um, an, an import. They came uh, back in the 1700s or 1600s with European settlers. So. Um, our worms are not native, um, but the jumping worms are um, especially not native. And the problem is that the, uh, they're being introduced now and they are actually altering the soil. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I do want to credit that video was from uh, Joyce Browning, who is a horticulturalist master gardener coordinator in Maryland. I'm not sure which county she's with but um, you can see the information about the video um, there on the screen. Okay, um, other questions about the jumping worms. I actually, I, I have a few things to say about them. They're called um, Alabama jumpers, Jersey wrigglers, snake worms, crazy worms. They, they do produce only a single generation each year that hatches in the spring. So you, um, if you find jumping worms at this point, they're probably pretty close to their uh, mature size. They're as big as they're going to get. They are asexual. They do not require um, sexual reproduction, and their eggs overwinter in protective cocoons. Um, I found this picture of a nightcrawler here versus the jumping worm here. The clitellum on the jumping worm is um, flush with the body and very white while it's raised on the um, night crawler. They, uh, the jumping worms are a problem because of their, the way that they degrade the soil quality. They remove all of the leaf litter, which can result in soil erosion and lower productivity of the soil. So if you get these in a wooded uh, area, you can have um, a reduction in the um, fertility of the surface soil, which um, kills plants. It, it reduces the diversity of the plants. It also reduces the layer of uh, thick and spongy humus that's typically in forest soil, um, leaving the soil very exposed and open to erosion and compaction. Um, you get a lot of nutrient loss. This particular slide is from the Wisconsin Department of natural resources. Um, so as consumers, what do we do to help stop the spread of the Asian jumping worms? Um, don't buy them as bait. Uh, they, they make terrific bait because it wiggles so much it attracts the fish, and, but don't buy them as bait. And especially if you buy them as bait, don't dump out the leftovers on the ground because you are spreading um, 
the, the worms. Don't buy them if you are a vermicomposter. Um, find earthworms that are not jumping worms. Don't release earthworms into the environment. Monitor your soil. If you think you are seeing um, the jumping worms, definitely identify that. And if you can, you know, eliminate them. You want to avoid organic mulch or soil unless it has been heat treated. And when you are planting, use bare root stock or seeds whenever possible to prevent the spread of the worms. So if you have an infestation, you definitely want to identify these positively. Bring a specimen into the extension service, again, please, in a container um, with alcohol. Report it to the help desk. Um, you can solarize soil to kill cocoons. And the other thing is, uh, as our presenter earlier mentioned, you, when you are moving from one site to another with hiking boots, clean them off. Clean your shoes off. So questions about our friend, the jumping worm. I don't see any more in the chat box. Does anyone have um, a question you can unmute? Oh, here's one. How do we identify them from earthworms and how do you uh, solarize soil? Okay, um, the, to identify them from the earthworms, the um, behavior is the biggest clue. If it's jumping and hopping, it's probably a jumping worm, but there's this structure on them called the clitellum, which is very uh, whitish, smooth, flush with the body, and it, let, me, let me go back one slide. Two slides, three slides, there it is, okay. The, the worm on the top is a night crawler, and this is a jumping worm, and you can see the difference in the clitellum. The earthworm is not white, um, and it is somewhat raised from the body. So that's, that's kind of um, the big clue, but that, the, the behavior is really the biggest thing. Um, to solarize the soil, um, we have, if you need um, specific instructions, it's basically put plastic over the soil, weight it down um, and let it sit for like six weeks. But we, we can get you very specific instructions if you, ha if you have soil that you want to solarize. Um, please send us a note at the help desk, mastergardener at pwcgov.org. And I'm sure that Christina can put that address in the chat box because I forgot to, I'm sorry. Okay, are we, are we good on our jumping worms? Um, you have one more question. Why not use them for fishing? Wouldn't that also kill them? Uh, it also sets them loose into the environment. So no, um, they, I mean, I, I, I've been out fishing with kids and how many times does someone kick over the bait bucket or yeah, the, the worm comes off the hook? Um, why, why introduce, you know, an invasive into our environment when there are other things that, that work? Okay. All right. Now, our final feature of the day is one that I know you've seen on your Facebook feed and in all of the media, the spotted lanternfly, which really happens to be a very beautiful insect. Um, it's, it's really pretty in all of its stages. Um, the early nymph stage that you see here is uh, the little uh, black creature with very vivid white spots, then it gets the red on it. Um, and, and then as an adult, it has these beautiful underwings in red and black and all the lovely spots. It, it really is a, a lovely um, organism. So the spotted lanternfly is considered to be native in China, India, Vietnam, Taiwan. It was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014. Now, I've pointed out to you with all of these creatures when they were first introduced or first realized that they were introduced, and this is the latest one, 2014, well, murder hornets a little later, but um, first found in 2014, and then um, it was detected in Winchester, Virginia in 2018. Um, it feeds on sap. It excretes honeydew, um, which promotes the growth of mold and mildew as it feeds. 
Um, it's believed that its long-term effects are that it's, it really is a stressor on trees because it mobs um, trees. You can see this in this photo, um, all of the lanternfly climbing up uh, a tree, and, and, and they really do mass like this. It is um, the long-term effects that it has on trees are being studied now. Um, in agriculture, the viticulturalists are truly concerned. It really likes grapevines um, and may require some really intensive management. Because it excretes that honeydew, um, it promotes the growth of sooty mold, which is never a good thing for plant health. And there's also, it, it's a nuisance concern. So it, it's actually not a fly. It's a plant hopper from the order Hemiptera, um, the family Fulgoridae. It's a really good jumper, but it doesn't fly well. It can glide as an adult. So it really doesn't get around um, under its own power. It, it can go a little ways, but most of the transportation is not under its own power. You can find it um, sheltering at the base of plants during the day, um, and it climbed back up the tree at night to feed. They really tend to group together. If you find one, you're going to find many. Um, it's easily disturbed, and it will hop off and hop away. Um, so it does try to avoid possible predators. And because it has um, piercing and sucking mouth parts, it does not bite or sting. There are lots of plants that it likes to feed on, and these are some of the ones that we would most likely encounter it on. Um, there's, it, it loves maple trees. Um, it also seems to like black walnuts. Uh, you'll find it on grapevines. Uh, it, it does like oriental bittersweet, and if you think about that, that makes sense. It is from the same region of the world that oriental bittersweet is from. Um, it will also eat our native sumac. But its best and most favorite host is the Tree of Heaven um, Alanthus. Uh, there's some Alanthus pictures here so that you can identify the Alanthus tree. But that's where we're setting most of our traps to find it. It has one generation each year. There is some overlap. Um, it lasts through the winter in the egg stage. Now, um, someone found a, an adult uh, spotted lantern fly at the uh, train station in at the Broad Run train station here in Manassas uh, very early in the season and it is believed that it potentially could overwinter um, that hasn't been proven uh, we do know that it overwinters in the egg stage but it's possible that if it's in a sheltered location it may be able to overwinter in the adult stage the nymphs emerge in early spring. That's why we were really surprised to find an adult uh, in the springtime. There are four immature stages which develop into mid-adults like right about now. Um, the eggs are laid after um, the feeding in the early late to fall. And typically the adults die after significant frosts. Again, there is some concern that it can overwinter in sheltered areas. Um, the egg masses look like this. The young nymphs, again, are the black and white, and the mature nymphs are the red with uh, white spots and black markings. And here we have the um, adult leaf hopper. You can see it, there's a uh, calendar down here. We would find eggs in the January through April time frame. Nymphs um, and adults. May through November, and then again, we're looking for eggs late November and December. The egg masses are really easy to overlook. Um, they can attach to almost anything. Uh, pallets, trees, uh, just all kinds of things, your car. The adults and the nymphs also can be transported. They hop on your, your vehicle or to a truck, and they just go along for the ride. They tend to pop up in really unexpected locations. We had some cases in Prince William County where they were popping up at really odd locations and um, found that they may have been hitching rides on cars that had been parked at transportation centers. So they are able to disperse uh, several miles on their own, but the biggest 
dispersal is along transportation corridors. This is a map from 2022 in March that shows um, the reported distribution. And again, this is from March. Um, you see that it, it was introduced, I, I can't remember if it was uh, Eastern Pennsylvania or New Jersey um, in nursery stock and spread through, throughout much of Pennsylvania into Maryland and um, it, it's spreading northwards as well. So um, we're tr the, the infestation is trying, we're trying to contain it, but um, I don't know that that's going to be a possibility. Now, <laughs> Here's, here's the piece that I really wanted to show you. I, I actually finished this presentation on uh, Friday of last week. And on Saturday, the Virginia Department of Agricultural and Consumer Services updated the status of Prince William County uh, to a quarantine spot and updated their um, map uh, showing the distribution of uh, reproducing spotted lanternfly. So you can see here's Prince William County right here, and we are now under quarantine. Um, the quarantine has spread from the area up here around Winchester south um, along the I-81 corridor. Uh, this happens to be a rail line corridor this way. Um, and there are a couple of um, isolated counties in southwest Virginia where the um, that are currently under quarantine. So what does that mean that we are under quarantine? Um, this, is, this is actually an outdated map. I should have pulled that one. This was from uh, March of 2021. Again, the current map is this one. Um, but the quarantines are designed to, to decrease the spread from infested to non-infested areas and in a quarantine, the movement of any life stages, that means eggs or uh, nymph or uh, mature adults, is prohibited. Prince William is under quarantine as of 7-9-22. Uh, uh, in order to move regulated materials out of quarantined areas, uh, you do need a permit issued by the Virginia Department of uh, Agricultural and Consumer Sci uh, Services and there is information online for you to, to take a look at. So uh, this is from Virginia, uh, from VDAX. The counties that were added are all these counties right here along with the cities listed. And this was the original. So the map shows there's the original quarantine and here's our extended quarantine. This is a map of Prince William County showing the locations where spotted lantern flies have definitively been found um, and are being monitored. And um, we have traps out. Uh, it's a concerted effort by the uh, Department of um, Pest Management, I believe it's called, and um, the Master Gardeners and Master Naturalists. Um, and we've been scraping. Uh, egg masses off of trees starting in January and monitoring traps. So these are the locations where um, spotted lantern flies have, uh, reproducing populations of spotted lantern flies have been found. So uh, this is what you as a citizen should do to help stop the spread of spotted lantern flies. Report any sightings of the spotted lantern flies. The QR code shown on your screen will take you to the reporting um, website. If you are going to travel out of the area and you live in an infested area, check your vehicle for egg masses or other life stages. Um, wash them off if you have to uh, before you leave the area. And there is more information online at um, the the website that's listed here. And again, you can get there by using that QR code. So um, here's the way to report in Prince William County. Um, and you can also just use the QR code. So if you are a business, you do have to have an inspection statement uh, for transporting goods. And that's what the inspection statement looks like. Um, for folks living in infested areas, and that is Prince William County, inspect vehicles and materials, remove any life stages of spotted lanternfly. If you are a business, you have to include 
the checklist with materials shipped or vehicles driven. Proactively check anything that you get uh, from known quarantined areas. And, and we're a known quarantined area. Avoid parking near Tree of Heaven where possible. Keep the windows rolled up. If you can, remove and manage Tree of Heaven. And, and this is a very long-term process. Um, chipping wood is an effective way to destroy eggs so that if you are you know, cutting down infected Tree of Heaven, and please don't do that without specific directions on what you need to do to follow up. But um, chipping the wood is effective to destroy the eggs. And please report your findings using the QR code once again. Oops, there's the QR code. So if you want to take a, a screenshot of that, that's probably not a bad plan. Okay, so I think I saw a spotted lantern fly. What should I do? Verify, make sure this is a spotted lantern fly and we're happy to help with the help desk. Um, please report it. If you can capture or squish nymphs and adults. You can leave it on the ground. You don't have to take it home with you. Um, those little handy bug vacuums work really well to, to get up a, a crowd of them. Putting them in soapy water is a way to kill them. Scrape any egg masses you see, double, double bag and use um, that expired hand sanitizer that you have. That works well to uh, kill the spotted lantern fly as well. Um, as a reminder, please do not use pesticides on county property unless you are a certified commercial applicator. And if you choose to use pesticides, uh, make sure that you are following label instructions. I'm not going to give pesticide directions for spotted lantern fly um, because that's just um, beyond the scope of, of what we're, we're going to do today. So um, the reporting site collects basic information about your sighting. Um, it's personal and contact information, the location, what life stage you saw, and any additional details. Pictures always help. Okay, I do have my bibliography listed here, and if anyone's interested in that, we can probably send it out with the survey. Um, do, I, I'm sure we have questions about spotted lanternfly. I don't see any in the chat box, but please unmute yourself and ask your questions if you have one. I will say they just, uh, last week I got two calls in here of possible sightings in the Dumfries area and also in my area in Woodbridge, which is near um, Veterans Park. Okay, I'm going to stop the screen sharing at this point. I thank you all for your attention and for uh, joining us this morning. And please, if you have specific questions, um, you are most welcome to email them to our help desk at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. And we'd love to give you some research-based answers. Uh, just for your info, I put the mastergardener.pwcva.gov. Okay. Uh, on, in the chat box, okay. both email addresses work currently, so you can email to either one. Okay. Well, and if there are no other questions, thank you everybody for attending, and we'll we'll get the video and the evaluation out probably early next week after we have time to edit the recording. Thank you all. Thanks. Have a great day. Have a good day. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on water quality, stormwater, lawns, gardens, landscapes, etc., contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcva.gov. Thank you, and we'll see you all the next time.